country. Changed everything, software market came around that. And so I was comparing interest in cloud, which I don't see as a revolutionary market. I think it's an, an extension, more linear extension of, yeah. of data center, et cetera. Exactly. But big data is a completely new industry. Do you agree with that? And if you do, could you, or, or, or as well, share your perspective? Because big data actually puts the hands of productivity, the productivity back on the hands of the user, the analyst, the C-level, the business manager, from military to retail. It's not it's just one industry. So, can you comment your perspective on that? If you take, uh, I'll go first, and I'll, uh, if you take uh, what Michelle just said, it's absolutely true. What is happening is what we call this, the, this, this almost a new business model, where because of what big data empowers you to do, which is deliver actionable insight, it doesn't really matter how you deliver it. So because now you have a platform that you can store all the data on, and you can process all of it, and structure really doesn't matter, but what the, the business user wants is actionable insight. And if you can give the actionable insight, and all the factors you just mentioned become enabling factors. The cloud is an enabler of doing that as a service. The fact that Hadoop is the scalable commodity hardware-based solution enables you companies like ours to build that at scale at incredibly, incredibly economical cost. And the last point is, just I agree with your comment, just like the PC made individuals like you and I have the power of computing on our fingertips, big data is finally bringing the business back in intelligence, where the business user can get the answer he or she wants in incredibly fast times for insights that really could not be delivered. People have struggled in writing reports and changing a column on a report that takes three months. And we're trying to change that paradigm and say, forget looking at the past. You have to be able to use the data you have, do predictive analytics and look at what will happen if you made an action based on insights that you can get and harness at massive scale. I think that's the, the massive leap that at least yeah. we, we notice and see. So the, the other key thing I think that's important there is that it's not just using, you know, so when I talk with customers and everybody looks and they say, look, there's this nirvana. I buy into the idea that predictive analytics, optimization, simulation technologies are going to get me game-changing business value, okay? And that's great but how do I get there? And what typically they do is they go back and they lean on what they already know, right? And they want to use their existing infrastructure, they want to use their existing, existing tools, data, right. they want to use their existing tools. They don't want to do anything different. And I say, well, if you don't do anything different, you're not going to get any different results, right? I mean, this is kind it's of the definition risk reward. of insanity, yeah, exactly. right? You got to take a risk. So, right, you got to take some additional risk. You got to infuse, right, your applications, you got to infuse your data with net new information if you want to have additional insights. Now, so that could mean taking your information and going to a deeper level, down to the transaction or granular level. Because you think about it, even today, like the people say to me, predictive insights, we've been doing predictive insights for some time, so how is this different? Well the difference, the aha moment, okay, is around not taking it and aggregating it and looking at big segmentations, big classifications, big but now going down to trans, you know, looking at micro segments, segments of right? Segments of one, I love that phrase, okay? So how do you get to doing that? You have to have all the big data to or, build your analytics. Or um, in predictive insights into things you don't know you don't yet. Know, absolutely. Which is yeah. the old model was, they knew what they were predicting. Exactly. When's the next thing going to happen that they know exactly. will happen? Exactly and right. I think one of the things that I'd like to get both of your comments on is a concept that so we've before been- Before you move there, I want to see, I just want to add one thing. Yeah. One of the things that I see around big data is what the big data is also not telling you. So there's a distinction, right? So today when people are talking about big data, they're essentially saying that there's a bunch of noise out in the ethosphere. And what you've got to get good at is finding the signal in all of that noise. And that definitely applies, right? But there's also the inverse of that, which is sometimes the big data is telling you its avoidance of information is actually telling you As quite much. a bit, right? Yeah. So you think what about not to it, do. it's the what white not? space, right? Yeah. It's all the stuff that you don't know about. That's so right. I was visiting with a large chemical company and I said, hey, are you, they chemicals, right? They're like, why are you talking to me about sensor data? And I said, well, because you make laminate tops, okay? Do you have any idea where those are used? Uh, do you yeah. know how they're sold through your distribution channel, but do you know where there's net new opportunity for revenue out in just the United States? Right. 
And they said, we could not possibly answer that question. And I said, you could put a chip in all of your countertops, right? And it's going to be anonymized. There's no privacy. But now all of a sudden you realize that you have a great void in the Midwest, as yep. an example. And then you have something you can actually go and do about that, create additional distribution, do all kinds of activities. But that non-existence of information should tell you a lot as well. Yeah, so, we, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no. This is the cube. There's okay. no one's seeing it. You know, ideas. You fight for airtime. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard with me. Um, it's like that movie jo uh, that Jodie um, Foster was on about contact, That's right. um, where that one little piece a opens blip. up into a massive amounts of data. It's hard to see in that, you mentioned white space, that kind of popped in my head, but that is really about big data. It's finding that one piece of grain. data, the grain of data in the overall noise and going, wow, and unpacking that going, look what's behind it. So, so with that, and for the folks who don't know, go check it out, it's a movie showing my age there, but <laughs> the concept that we've been kicking around on this point is the notion of derived data. You can't derive anything if you don't have data. So one of the things that we actually talked about at IBM Edge uh, this past event where the storage group was actually reorganizing around you know, analytics actually, which is smart, um, is ingestion of data, capturing data is a real big part of it. So I'd like both of you guys to talk about the trends of capturing data because obviously unstructured and structured is, is, is the way to go, but what is your uh, views on the current trends around the emphasis on capturing data? I, I Knowing that derived data might be I, I think, here's what we tell our, cl our clients, and I think ev everybody agrees to the concept of storage is free, John. You know, st storage absolutely is free. And it's not free sitting on tape, right, because we, we need to stop, stop talking about that. It is free sitting on, on disk as well. Our advice always is, you have to be able to understand and, and very quickly realize ROI on the problems you need to seek. The challenge becomes, to the point you just made, you actually don't know what the ROI could be if you actually had all the, the, all the information. So here's how we start, we say look, and this, this is, these are common problems. An average large financial institution, or actually another company with an online presence, will generate between 10 to 20 petabyte, uh, sorry, terabytes of data a day on online mobile platforms. That they actually throw away. They literally can't keep it. Why, it's too expensive to even keep it. On disk or just managing In it? General. In general. Just, just storage, forget analytics, but just storage. The, the fact, and you and I both know, that there are companies built around managing online data, right? Google being the name that comes to mind. Profitable companies as well. <laughs> and, and, and you look at you, you look at it and you go, well, but that doesn't really make sense. Why would you not keep this data where you need to keep it? Store all of it. And to the point you just made, and the point Michelle made, we may be seeing this flicker of what I call a data set that, that may seem as out of normal range today, but may become a signal very quickly. You will not be able to do it if you can't keep it. We are seeing a universal acceptance of that fact. Almost everybody is going in and saying, unless I have a platform powered by the HDFS ecosystem, and I'm not capturing every single piece or trace of information, whether it's from a sensor, an inanimate object, product or service, my customers themselves, or my employees and my internal data, and not putting it together, to find the knowledge that it is hidden in it, I will lose the gold that's sitting in there, yeah. which will not be mine. So there's a, there's a whole concept of you should store what you can keep. See, I think, I think the game on that is over. Storage. Storage for data. is easy. Storage for data. And it will be HDFS. And it will be HDFS. And, and, and the thing we're telling people is unless, if you find a company, you guys are the masters of tribal knowledge on big data, right? <laughs> I called you the, the tribalists. You are the new tribal leaders <laughs> of this ecosystem. <laughs> All right, that's right? us. A little kumbaya there. But, Thank you. Uh, but unless, if, if you are not seeing companies and products, and analytics not being built on the HDFS ecosystem is game over. On the batch side, no doubt. Right. Okay, done deal, put a, put a fork in that it's done. Right. The big question that's on everyone's mind at this show this year is, right. how do I get the data out of that? Near real time's cool, but I need it faster, I need it in bigger chunks. So right. there's a big but emphasis but on that the was, analytics. Uh, that was Avi's point, which is a lot of that data today is almost like exhaust, where it gets generated out of some device, out of some system, and it's not being used, or it's used for a small portion yes. of its actual usage. So what you see, starting to see to evolve, is all different types of stream computing engines, right? Where what's, it, and so it's a little bit of a misnomer, uh, okay? 
because um, the stream computing engines, what everybody's looking to do is do the real-time analytics. And you're not actually going to be building the model on the fly, which everybody seems to her, sort of have this notion around that, but there's not enough data to actually build the model on the fly. You could adapt uh, it on the fly, but absolutely. you're not going to be able to build it. So what you see is all that stuff getting coming capped, in. coming in, you'll have a real-time model that will score it in real time and take some kind of action on that. And then you're going to see that data then feed into back-end systems Absolutely. that can, and Hadoop and HDFS is perfect for that because it do, you don't have to worry about the known value quality of it yet, right? You could just store it in mass and, at free and, and then come back to your point earlier, John, around it's a data liberation period, right? Where all of the users, what you want to do is expose this to them so they can, we're not going to bind ourselves anymore in terms of these are prescribed analytic insights for the organization, right? Yeah. So the platforms of the future, just like with Trasada, are going to have prescriptive type of analytics in them, right? What I mean, what I mean prescriptive is not, it, they're going to pr predict the insights, okay? And they're going to no solve known business problems, but they're also going to be open formats where people can actually do that self-discovery because the platform has brought together internal data, real-time data, external data that's going to evolve, and that all of it's going to be there and ready and transparent for them to so use. So Michelle, are you, are you saying that then that um, the first step in the journey is get some sort of vertical purpose-built application nailed first with the flexibility for data transport? I, is think, that it's a, I think it's a subtler point, I'm about to yeah. add to it. A, a great example of this is Nathan Raz, right? We all love Nathan, bag type guy, super smart, now yeah. on Twitter, has built Storm, right? Storm is a real time mm -hmm. processing app that now works off HDFS. But there are two concepts, it's prequels are now in fashion. I'm going to use two pre words that are very important. One Nathan used, and I agree with him, and one we use at Crusader, is the concept of pre computation. So even with Storm, so, the, so you have to pre compute certain insights. So if you, if, you, if you and I were to split the big data, analytics into two parts. What I call discovery and analysis and mm -hmm. delivery. The delivery has to be real time. There are very few tools, John, even in the old relational world, yeah. where discovery and analysis is done real time. Even in the trading environments, you don't discover and write algorithms sub-second, you don't. You build and write algorithms at best, at best, on a daily level. It's called pre-computation. And once you figure out the triggers that give you the advantage, you then implement deliver yep. on a near real, near real, or actually sub-second response time. Storm, right? The best project for real-time analysis in Hadoop. Mm -hmm. And you look at how Nathan describes it, same concept. He has a pre-computation there, which he pre-computes on certain factors to do this discovery analysis, finds new factors, has a three hour lag. But once he's found that out, then he is three hours late. But it's not near real time. So discovery analysis yeah. always has a lag. Delivery can absolutely be made real time. Transaction processing, aka delivery, is always real time. That's one part. The other part that we believe in is what we call pre-curation. I think that is where you, you and I, and I want you to do this, when you get people come on and ping them on it. There is a lot of existing data. It's all publicly available. Whether it's the government, whether it's education, Mark Andreessen nailed it, right? Software is eating the world. And I think data is making that software monster even more hungry. So, and he picks the verticals out, right? He says education, financial services, government, healthcare. You look at all of those four key verticals, a lot of the data is already publicly available. What has not been done to it? It hasn't been pre-curated. What I mean by that is you can take, go, you can go and get census information. You can go and get weather information. You can go and get healthcare information. Now you need to do in a platform to be intelligent, pre-curated, and if you actually have pre-curated the data, put it in one place, found the common linkage, found the correlation, and then done the pre-computation, I can deliver you real-time insights that no one else can. I think those two main concepts of who is pre-curating data and who is pre-computing the analytics, whoever is bringing that together is truly a game changer. Well, who, who do you see bringing that together? Well, in, uh, <laughs> I got to be a little humble with you, but yeah. in, in, in the financial services space, that is our goal. I think. Splunk, Splunk has done a phenomenal job, by the way. So we, you've heard me say this before. There, there is a, a rise in what we call, in the last 10 to 20 to 15 years, you saw horizontal data stacks being built. IBM is a master at it, right? So 
uh, the hardware, yeah. the operating system, server operating system, and the data operating system. We are now seeing the emergence of what we call vertical data systems, end-to-end -end data systems. Splunk calls themselves the Google of machine data. All they do is machine data and nothing else, right? Google is the Google of online data. Facebook is the same for social data. We, our ambition is to do the same for financial data. And, I, and, and we really hope that the same thing happens on healthcare, on education, on government. Because the tools that exist, the model exists, the data exists. You gotta put it all together, mm -hmm. pre-compute, pre-curate, and then the last miss and most important part, deliver actionable insight. And that's where all these concepts on the smack stack, analytics, cloud, all of them come together. Because they're all enabling factors. They're not the main factor, which is if you and I can build a company, deliver actionable insight to solve healthcare problems, to solve financial problems, to solve educational problems, that company, that model will absolutely be the winner. Yeah, and yeah. That'll, that'll be proof positive. No one can deny that. No one can deny, exactly right. So, there will be lots of vertical companies that'll spring up, and you'll see, kind of like we did in the ERP era, where there'll be a lot, you'll see that we'll have best of breed come out of that. There'll, there'll be a path littered with those that have died along the way, because doing what Trasada has done is not easy to do. And then you're going to start to see some consolidation in terms of the plays that are available out there. I think what you're also going to see is that the delivery mechanisms for these types of platforms are going to be threefold, okay? They'll be in the cloud, both public and private um, ones, so an extension of as the data center, as you mentioned. We, we call and them then, as a service, the word cloud yeah, scares people away. But, I, but, but I the same you. concept, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. infrastructure, platform, software, and appliance, exactly. and that's the stack, yeah. right? Exactly. If you get to an exactly. appliance, you get everything. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. so it, that's, that's what an it's appliance. all about. Okay, it's exactly. everything underneath. Exactly. So exactly. And what you see is, there will be some people that'll come to market around horizontal type of applications. There'll be people that'll come to it around vertical. I actually think what Trasada has done is not really a vertical play as much as it is a disruptive business model, okay? Because what they're focused on is total view of the customer, okay? And that is very different. So yes, your first go to market is around financial services, but it parlays very well into retail, into CPG, into many other vertical industries. And what I think they're actually doing is breaking down the barriers, the walls, those functional siloed walls, because they're focused on this different perspective. And the I business think model, the business model advantage for you is a short term enabler to get to the marketplace. That's exactly right. And, but also, I mean, and you're, because you're a startup and you're growing. Right, so and, like, and we can take some, to your point, risks that no other large company would do. Yeah, you're nimble. But, yeah, but look, Jeff, Jeff, Jeffrey Moore is talking tomorrow. It's a classic crossing the chasm. I, I agree with you, and thanks for the compliment. I think the ability to break down internal silos, but if you're crossing the chasm, right? Yeah. You, you got to prove it out. You got to land on your feet when you jump. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah like, exactly. Hopefully and, it's not a big yeah, Grand Canyon, but you know. Yeah, man, and, and, and hopefully. Evil can evil. Uh, that was Snake and, River yeah, Canyon. And, and hopefully it's not a false floor. But you keep jumping, and the first and the second jump you make, it's broken, right? So I think the crossing the chasm approach is, uh, is optimal. We have to together find, you, you do it. You have, you have to find the signal from the noise and find companies that are enabling this next wave of innovation where you're breaking the business model, you're breaking the mold, you're delivering the answers, but you have to pick, and this is my advice to every single entrepreneur, you have to pick a business problem to solve. Because once you've solved it and you've shown, you've shown that whether it's pre-computation, pre-curation, whether it's the appliance, whether it's a HDFS based analytics, whatever it may be, you have to show that someone's willing to buy it, someone agrees with you, a, a checker agrees with you that there is value in it, and a large implementation in a vertical has to come back to a vertical that is proving truly disruptive to existing business models can be done. And then you can expand, because I do agree with you. I think our total view of customer engine has the potential to be applied Across. to multiple areas. Right? Yes. So the other way that you see evolving in the marketplace, and IBM does this, is in our big um, insight stack, we have all these accelerators that come as part of the stack. So we have, so some of the tough problems that are trying to be solved here are, how do I take analytics and actually write analytics across, across a, in an MP, or excuse me, in an HDFS environment, in a map reduce, exactly. and it ain't easy, okay? Exactly. So we have all these predefined accelerators. We have text analytics, we have machine learning analytics that come out of the box. And then what we're doing is moving up the stack to 
application accelerators, okay, so model accelerators. So, you know, churn is churn is churn. Well, your churn might be a little bit different, right? So in telco, it's rotational churn, but it's going to be somewhere between a 60 to an 80% fit to get them started more readily, right? As opposed to, I need to go build the algorithms, then I have to build up from yeah. there to the model, then I have to figure out all the other components, Agreed. right? And so all of this is moving towards much faster Absolutely. pace. But I think that. the other so thing is, is, I think good news for us, you know, the biggest question we get when we walk to our clients on big data analytics, security. And I smile when I hear that because what that tells me is all the other questions that you and I were even seeing yeah. 12 months ago are gone. Yeah. No one questions HDFS anymore. No one questions the ability to actually run analytics on such I mean, and, and, and data. security table stakes to be enterprise ready. And they, I think everyone knows it. Doug Cutting was just on here saying right. it. So guys, I we're going to use the last two minutes um, of our segment here. I would like you guys to share um, your observations with what's happening here. Uh, we're here at uh, Hortonworks Hadoop Summit in San Jose, in Silicon, heart of Silicon Valley. Describe for the folks who aren't here who are watching, what's happening here, what's the vibe, what's your observations, what could you share about for the folks who aren't here roaming the hallways, bumping into all the different conversations? You go first. Okay. So um, first observation is that it's, there's a lot of buzz, right? There's over 2,000 people here. That's, that shows you this is coming of age, right? So that's number one. Number two is that you see people moving up the stack in terms of the types of, app, the types of tools, the types of applications that are um, coming about. And as Avi just said very well, which is people, the, the questions people were asking even six months ago, okay, are, have fallen by the wayside. Those are all assumptions and everybody's moving m closer to enterprise ready. Okay, so those are the three big observations that I have seen so far today. But first thing, if you're not here, you've got to be here. <laughs> uh, you and I have done this now, how many years? Three years? Yeah. I've seen this grow from 200 people to 2,000, right? It's yeah. an exponential growth. Secondly, I think a very reassuring thing for me, you are one of the earliest companies to go out and say the action's going to be in the application space. There's money to be made. A <laughs> lot of money to be made. Money. Right? The number, sorry, go ahead. It's a money machine. It's a money machine. The number that uh, Sean shared in the morning, $100 billion, to my old friends at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, the analyst report, a $100 billion market. There's a lot of money to be made. Third, for me, and personally, this is reassuring for me, it's all about use cases. I've seen the conversation go from technology, pieces, architectures to where are the use cases? Right? So there's a lot of money to be made, but people are saying, show me the money as well. There's so much more and, it's, and they're actually showing it. And they're showing it. There's yeah. so much more activity and, and real knowledge base around real use cases outside the web, which is cool. incredibly reassuring. Uh, folks, this is a groundbreaking event. Obviously, it's the inaugural Hortonworks version of Hadoop Summit. Last year, Yahoo ran it, but they spun out Hortonworks at that time, and uh, Hadoop World is now run by O'Reilly Media. And let me just tell you my view of what's happening here, as I said it earlier, this is about tech conversations. A lot of developers here, not a lot of suits, a lot of tech geeks, alpha elite forces of, of the tech athletes, as we call them, are here, because it's really, they're solving hard problems. And I think the use cases and the dollars in the valley of the opportunity is, it's like everyone's at the top of the mountain looking down in the valley of, yeah. of wealth creation and, and value creation in a way that's gettable. I completely it's a very disruptive market, and uh, it's great to have you guys on here. Thank you. Again, Thank you. great conversation. Uh, Michelle Chambers from IBM Natiza, General Manager, Vice President, and Avi Mehta, the uh, founder of Trisada, uh, growing startup doing really cutting edge work around analytics, uh, curation, what do you use, the predictive? Uh, Pre-curation. Pre Pre-curation. Pre and and uh, <laughs> pre-computation. Pre <laughs> Got it. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. We'll be right back with our next guest after this break. <laughs>